Hi, we're live at the Javits Center for the Nest Summit. Today we're talking about financial revolution and global waste management. And I'm joined by Stefan Niccolo from Full Cycle. Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Jeff. So Stefan, we've had a lot of conversations this week and a lot of them have been around the fact that climate change is coming and we've got to kind of get out of the way of it. And a lot of companies talking about playing defense or adaptation or mitigation. And this is the first conversation and I'm thrilled to have that is really talking about it from a solution standpoint. Sure. So tell me a little bit about the work that Full Cycle is doing out in the world. Happy to. First, let me just say um, climate change is here. And that's a big distinction that we've got to make when we talk about how we adjust and how we manage risk that's coming for us all and for every portfolio. Um, you know, the reality of, of the industries that are contributing to climate change is that everything needs to be overhauled, right? Energy, agriculture, logistics, transportation. And so at Full Cycle, we're oriented towards the solutions that can meaningfully address the problem but backed by real science and real understanding of how we're emitting, what we're emitting, and the time frame in which we've got to address the problem and build solutions for it. So we invest in all sorts of technologies at the infrastructure level that can find new ways to deal with waste, that can produce new kinds of energy and store it in new ways, um, that allow us to yield and output more from our agricultural solutions and then our idea is to accelerate those solutions into the market. Because in a shortened time frame with climate change already here, we don't have time to uh, spray and pray in venture models or to do small vanity projects here and there around the world. We've really got to get good at scale. And that's what we're oriented towards. Can you give our audience a specific example of a company or a technology or product that you're talking about so they can kind of connect the dots around all of this? Sure. So our first investment is in a company based out of the Netherlands in the United States called Sonova. Sonova makes waste to value technologies. So imagine the next generation of a technology that can take any kind of waste, agricultural waste, municipal solid waste, and convert it into something of value. Because what we're doing now is we're taking things uh, of value, like plastic waste, like agricultural waste, and we put them in a landfill. Or we, worse, we put them in an incinerator. And in that uh, function in the market, we are taking something of value and throwing it away. Except we live on planet Earth, there's no away. So all of those things decompose into methane, nitrous oxide, and CO2, and have a warming effect on the environment. So our solution instead converts things like plastic waste back into plastic, or into clean forms of energy for use in our economy. When we talk about sustainability, we have topics like ESG, values-based investing, and impact-based investing. Um, we've talked a lot about the fact that we kind of think about it as a GPS, and that the data in the GPS is your ESG data. Mm. The route preferences that you could take in your GPS are your values preferences that you can put on top of your portfolio. But the destination is impact investing, mm. because the destination is intentional and it's measurable. So when you're doing investing at full cycle, how are you measuring the impact that you're having? That's a good question. So, you know, in the market today, there's kind of two realms. There's do less harm, and we couch a lot of ESG and do less harm. And all of its work that needs to be done that is additive and is helpful to both the economy and the ecology of our world and people. But then there's also the other end, other end of the spectrum, which is do ordered and ranked good. Right? And that's what we're oriented towards, is solutions based on the science of climate change that let us know what we should be focusing on and in what order we should build those solutions. And how we measure that is on two kind of axes. The first is what's emitted by the problem. So imagine agricultural waste or coal-fired plants or um, anything in transportation and logistics that emits methane into the atmosphere. Uh, methane is 86 times more heat trapping than CO2. So while most folks in ESG land focus on CO2, we're super nuanced and focused on these climate pollutants like methane, nitrous oxide, fluorinated hydrocarbons that have an outsized warming effect in a shortened period of time. And then the other axis, axis is time. All the data that we see around climate change is based on a 100-year timeline. 
But in 100 years, Jeff, you and I, well, if we're here, <laughs> are having a different conversation about the solutions that we yes, want to build. Yes. So we've shortened that time frame down to 20 years. What's the impact we can have on a shortened time frame of 20 years based on the problem as it exists in that same 20 year time frame? And what we find is when you start to order the climate pollutants that are causing the warming on a 20 year time frame and the solutions that can address those pollutants and where they're emitted in abundance in our atmosphere, you get a very clear picture about what to focus on and how to get those solutions out into the market. I'm curious, it's kind of like this U chart that I am thinking about because the more people understand and see in the visible world that climate risk is here and it's here today. I mean, yeah. we can look across California for the hottest temperatures on record over the last few weeks. We can look at the fires in California. Yeah. We can look at record fires across Australia, storms doubling in strength overnight in the Gulf of Mexico. So. The, the acknowledgement that climate risk is here to stay yeah. is, is starting to catch a majority in the United States, yeah. thank God. Um, but is that having an effect on people's willingness to make investments in solutions? So you're seeing a direct correlation to that. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned earlier kind of offense versus defense, right? Um, I think if any investor is looking at their portfolio Defense is maybe we shouldn't be invested in real estate in Miami Beach, right? That's not a long-term right. investment we want to be in. Offense is what are the solutions that operate in the nexus of having the outsized climate effect of solutions that we want to have for the problem and are financially compelling enough so that we don't have to be invested in the real estate project in Miami Beach, right? So that intersection is super important to understand for any investor. But playing offense means investing in those solutions and scaling them so that they become the infrastructure that we get to build that yields both financial returns, but also has less of a weight on our ecosystems and on, a, on the climate. We're obviously in a world today where social justice is being called for in a way that we certainly haven't seen since the 60s sure. in the United States. And it's about time that we're addressing a lot of these issues. How does that translate it to climate justice? Because a, a lot of people understand inherently what social justice is. Sure. Um, they might stand on the wrong side of it, but at least they understand what it is. Yeah. How do we correlate that to climate justice? I mean, there's a lot of links to, to both of those issues. I, mean, I say it very simply, justice is justice. And if we think about kind of where we have built what is taxing our climate uh, and, our, and our environment, most of that infrastructure is built in low-income neighborhoods or low-income neighborhoods were built around that infrastructure. So the statistic is that 70% of black and brown families in the United States live within 20 miles of a coal-fired coal -fired power plant. All right, so small things about air quality uh, based on your proximity to a coal-fired plant have implications for health outcomes for children or for folks who need to get to work every day. And so what we think about building, where we build it, and most of all, in whose service we are building it, really matter. And this is about the choices that we've got to make uh, as a society. Do we want to build a fair and equitable society that is also sustainable, right? Or do we want to continue the status quo of kind of clustering folks who have little, little advocacy about where they can go elsewhere uh, around infrastructure that is no longer serving us anyway? We've really got to make a choice here, and I think the two issues are intricately and inextricably related. Stefan, what do you see as the biggest gaps in achieving the climate goals that are so imperative to be reached? Um, and is there a connection to the work that you're doing around the SDGs? Do you use that in any way, the sustainable development goals yeah. and targets of the UN in how you're measuring impact? Yeah, of course. I mean, what a, um, what a great framework that the UN put together uh, a, a few years ago to kind of really guide the markets to understand how we should be building forward. I think without it, you know, we would have a whole lot of the uh, do less harm still and not so much the ordered good. So I think it's been a really good framework. And for us, it's a guiding star because we can measure and understand our impact along these frames. Um, I think some of the challenges are less so what we faced even three or four years ago, which was more climate denial and kind of challenging of the science. That's, you hear that a little bit less now. Um, I think more so it's about our political will mm -hmm. and it's about capital. And 
those two things come together in super interesting ways. So for instance, are we gonna choose to establish and nurture a really robust market for green bonds and for debt instruments that are specific to financing the projects that are clean and green? Are we going to do that both as a country and as you know, the United States gonna play a role in the global environment in actually fostering this industry? Or are we gonna to continue to put those incentives and those instruments towards oil and gas and infrastructure that's no longer serving us in the way that it should? So these are about choices we've gotta make. Um, but I do think that's a challenge. And then I think the private sector really has to step in and say, hey, here's an opportunity for us to do well and do good. We should embrace it and pour capital into that uh, into that space because it's going to take trillions of dollars, right? And even full cycle, you know, we're oriented, we're raising a fund now, we're oriented towards building solutions out of our out of our fund. But even if we raised the hundreds of billions of dollars necessary in the sectors where we've decided to focus, it's not enough. So we need every financial player to come in and really spur this market at scale to start building the things that can really help us. Do you see possibilities for new ways of raising capital or blended finance or what are the instruments that you're looking towards to solve this gap. I know uh, at the UN they say there's a two to five trillion dollar annual gap in yeah. meeting the sustainable development goals and it's one of the reasons why the UN was really first recently open to embracing the public markets and working outside of the government and NGO world because yeah. they realized that there was no way there was enough capital within the government and NGO world to solve these problems. Is there a possibility of seeing this kind of blended finance model between NGO, government money, and private sector money? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think the idea that the same old instruments can achieve the results for a very new, very large problem isn't gonna work. Like, we're gonna need to think about new ways of deploying capital, and that includes all of the instruments that we know and ones that can be innovated at all the financial institutions that have a lot of wherewithal to do that. Um, so blended capital for sure plays a huge role um, I really do believe that every kind of institution, corporate, government, NGO, even consumers, play a role in what capital gets deployed and where, what solutions we invest in collectively because we decide they're for our public good. Um, you know, this is going to take some new thinking and, you know, we're happy to be on the forefront of it. You know, we invest in a dual, dual nature, so about 15-20% of our portfolio is invested in growth equity pretty well-known, pretty familiar to institutional investors. But 85, 80 to 85% of the portfolio is in infrastructure assets. And marrying those two gives us the ability to accelerate solutions, right? We grow the company by deploying more and more of their assets that are infrastructure assets. And so it's a small example, but it's one that really points to what can happen when you start to think a little bit outside of the box of, of traditional instruments and really have a goal of, figuring out what needs to be solved, how best we solve that, and then working backwards towards the instruments that'll help us do that. Stefan, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Stefan's from Full Cycle, one of the rare companies out there that are trying to solve the climate problems in the world. You were live at the Nest Summit at the Javits Center. Thank you.